the mind, the mind in this, is, uh, this word mind it is, means uh, thoughts, uh, emotions, the conditions of So your thinking process, your emotional uh, habits, the changing conditions of the mind. And then consciousness is vijnana. And the five khandas, and we talked about the rupa, vedana, sanya, sankara, vijnana, then the anicca, so in the Theravadan practice, there's a lot of confusion around uh, vijnana because it, we think uh, can, uh, vijnana is impermanent. So we hold to, to the idea of impermanence uh, and apply that to all experience. <coughs> so we can be very attached to the idea of impermanence. And then, in, in some ways, intellectually project that onto, to uh, you know, in our mind, to uh, everything that we experience. But vinyana is, uh, say, putting it in a context of it's, it's a natural condition. It is is boundless. It has, we. It's not just of the function of the brain, as we tend to conceive it in the Western world. <coughs> so in an immeasurable state, you have infinite consciousness as a, as a, you know, as a, as a kind of absorption. Consciousness has no boundary, like space, visual space and consciousness, when you really investigate, like visually, with is looking at space. It has no no boundary. We put boundaries into space, like the walls of this meditation hall, but actually the meditation hall is in space. And this is important to to reflect upon because uh, sometimes we emphasize the four elements, the earth, fire, water and air. And, and not even mention the unlimited ones of space and consciousness. They're also part of that. So to contemplate space, it's here and now, isn't it? It's not, you're not, you don't, it's not, subtle even, it's not remote, it's just not noticed. You know, we give so much attention to the forms and the things and the spaces. <coughs> we, you know, we like this and we don't like that, and big and small, and, and compare one thing with another. So the thinking mind is endlessly uh, moving with, with the conditions. But space, uh, to recognize space which means to notice it, pay attention, like on, to to uh, sight. By withdrawing your focus and absorption into the conditions in the space, uh, to see space, I don't need to to uh, tell you all to leave this room so I can really contemplate space. I just withdraw my attention. I'm no longer just focusing on this one and that one, but uh, no longer absorbing myself or moving from one thing to the next. But noticing in this wide spectrum of vision the reality of space as experience, and it's spacious. Space has that quality of, I mean, it's quite like a Obvious truism is spacious. <laughs> and it contains everything, doesn't it? The, the red and the green and the purple and the 
blue, male, female, good, bad, right, wrong, beautiful, ugly. Space doesn't have any preferences. And it has no boundary. So this is reflecting on the reality of space. It gives you perspective, isn't it? If you have perspective then on the forms and the conditions in the space. Consciousness also. Consciousness has no boundary. We put boundaries into consciousness with our thoughts and our attachments to our feeling, our sensory uh, feeling, pleasure, pain, our emotional uh, habits that we've acquired since birth. We, that puts boundary, that's a boundary, isn't it? It arises and ceases when you're happy. It's it has no permanence, it has permanence, it comes and goes, sadness, anger, greed, fear, jealousy, love, hate. And so when we're attached to, to thinking, to thoughts, to perceptions, to sense objects, uh, to our feelings, then we're always in this kind of mortal state of where, you know, there's something imperfect, unsatisfactory, inadequate about it. Even with all the money in the world and all the power, uh, say that a single human being might be able to acquire, the problem's still there. You know, the ignorance, the attachment, the feeling of inadequacy, of suffering, of dukkha, of loneliness, of some lack or something incomplete, unfinished. Then we take that personally. You know, we, we, is, I feel incomplete or unfulfilled or unsatisfied. Because, why do I do that? Because I'm always attaching to that which is that way. If I attach to unsatisfactoriness, how can I be sat uh, satisfied? <laughs> do I become a person who feels dissatisfied? <coughs> so the missing factor then uh, is the awareness. The, the the suffering is a cause is is caused through ignorance of ikka, not understanding the Dhamma, and the attachment, the way we cling to conditions out of ignorance is the cause. So then the insight is to let go, this letting go. In the Pali, Pahadapanthi means to, to abandon or let go of, put down, release your grasp. It doesn't mean throw away, or, you know, uh, uh, annihilate, it's not annihilation. It's letting things be what they are, letting letting it go, not grasping. <coughs> so then the insight is to practice this, just noticing attachment and and making attachment fully conscious is the way of letting go of it. 
we can't just let go because we, we've got the idea that we should let go of everything. And, and then we attach to the idea of letting go. And that usually ends up, you know, uh, clinging to, to uh, ideas of renunciation, of getting rid of everything, throwing everything out the window. To carry it to an extreme, become a kind of homeless wanderer by letting go of everything. Let go of all your clothes, you go stark naked. <laughs> Let go of any security and means you, you get rid of everything, which is very idealistic, isn't it? It's taking, letting go and grasping the idea of it. Now, letting go is, 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 uh, is to be, you know, is, is an insight. It's not an ideal. And how, do, how can you really let go of anything? Is, and the, the only way I found this, the, the skillful way of letting go is b through uh, consciousness, through allowing everything to be conscious that arises, that all the thoughts, the memories, things that, feelings that arise, that impinge on us, to allow them to be conscious and then they go. The consciousness is, is, a, is a vehicle for these things to manifest, these karmic conditions, they, they arise and they cease. And you don't have to kind of force them out, resist and get rid of, but just allow this natural process to take place because the relationship then to conditions is, is no longer judging it about getting rid of and, and uh, trying to destroy, annihilate anything, but understanding the causes of suffering. And in the insight, letting go of the causes means that desire itself <coughs> is a natural energy that we experience this is a desire realm that we're living in, the sense realm. The bodies we have, they desire forms, isn't they? They're, they're for procreating the species. They have senses where we, you know, they see what is beautiful and we desire. We desire, to, we see something, we desire to have it, or see something we don't like, the desire to get rid of it. So desire is, is not the problem. Dhanha is not the real problem. It's the ignorance. So in reflecting, we're actually <coughs> recognizing, acknowledging desire, not, not judging it. Because once we judge it, we've got to get rid of all our desires. I have to get rid of all my desires is, a, is still uh, attachment to the idea of desire is, is something that I have a lot of and I've got to get rid of it in order to become enlightened. So the, it's a delusion, isn't it? That's a creation out of ignorance. So awakening then is recognizing desire. It's energy. It moves, it arises, ceases. And the awareness then allows this desire to be seen, consciously recognized. Uh, the three kinds of desire, conveniently, they, they describe the dharma dhanha, bhava dhanha, vipava dhanha. Dharma dhanha, sensual desire, what we perceive through senses <coughs> and desire arises through, uh, through seeing you know, the, the attractiveness, the beauty, 
for pleasure through, sense, through the senses. Then there's a bhavadana, desire for becoming. And that's oftentimes what we're operating on in meditation. Bhavadana is, a, is oftentimes what we're doing when, we're, when we think we're meditating. We're trying to become something. Or vipadana, a desire to get rid of things. We can also be sitting here trying to get rid of bad thoughts and, and uh, negative emotions. So desire to, this desire to become, it's ambition, or the, the desire to, to achieve and attain, and desire to annihilate and get rid of and destroy. So these, you can actually witness observe from this through consciousness. So you're not annihilating or or getting rid of conscious consciousness is the is is uh, the means that we're using. Allowing consciousness informing our conscious experience here and now with wisdom to be free from ignorance. Avicca. So in my own practice, I became very, I became really interested in desire. Well, you know, as a person, uh, my, my, my uh, cultural conditioning, my Christian background is, uh, you know, evil desires you've got to get rid of. They're born by the devil and you've got to get rid of them. And uh, you've got to cultivate the good desires and get rid of the bad. That's how my personality is conditioned in that way. So just operating on a personal level doesn't work. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not misleading. So in the uh, teaching of the Four Noble Truths, you know, this letting go of desire, it's not destroying it. And to let go of something, you have to know what it is. You can't let go of just a, as an idea that you should let go. You're going to always <coughs> fail and feel despair and hate yourself even more, maybe. <laughs> so, so it's a, Awakening, observing, knowing. Dhanha. You can feel it in a desire, wishing for, wanting, wanting to get rid of. And what is it that knows this? to no desire. Is the, is, desi is uh, like to desiring Nibbana. We might desire the, you know, the idea of enlightenment. But then the awareness, the awakened state, takes us out of the desire realm. We begin to see desire, even the desire for enlightenment or of Nibbāna. Not as something to annihilate, but something to let go of. No longer operating from uh, ideas about Nibbāna enlightenment and about yourself as being someone who's ignorant, who has to become somebody who is enlightened. You're, you're actually, through awareness, returning or realizing a natural state of being. Mm. Ajahn Chak referred to it as our real home. This is where we really belong. 
the natural state of being that isn't conditioned. And that is recognized and realized through by awakened attention, awareness, uh, through consciousness. Now I found in, when you're really aware so at this moment, just in the state of attention, awakened attention, then <coughs> you can begin to notice the, what I call sound of silence, or a kind of background vibration, high pitch kind of electric vibration. First, it seems like a, something. Some people think it's tinnitus. It's a disease. I've heard meditators fighting against it. <coughs> In the Burmese tradition, they say, "Sound, sound." <laughs> Try to get rid of it. <laughs> but uh, it's it's not something to get rid of or. It's not a really a sound, is it? It's not. It just seems that way. So the sense of listening is uh, this broad spectrum of listening, not at anything in particular. So it's a, it's in the background, and once you begin to recognize it, it of course it's a stream, it's a flow, isn't it? It's a it's a stream of, it's a vibratory stream. And it's, and it's always present, it's always here now, and, and it, uh, but we don't notice it. We tend to even if we notice it, we dismiss it. We don't know what it is. It's also very strong uh, when you're in places like it where water is falling or stream, or you hear the sound of flowing water or falling rain. Uh, kind of continuous natural sound, the sound of the waves or at the ocean. If you really notice, if you listen to the sound of waves or rain falling or, or, or a waterfall, behind all the, the sound that, that the water is making is this nada sound or sound of silence. Now this is, this point here is the, your mind is actually you're in, you, that's the kind of point you can't get beyond. You can distract yourself from it by absorbing into something, like like uh, focusing on an object and and concentrating on an object, where that sound of silence is no longer remembered. But if you recognize this, it's like the what the uh, the center point. The eye of the storm, the still point of the turning world. It's that. It's that. That image. It's like a point, a still point that includes, rather than an exclusion of everything. It's. Uh, it includes everything. It has no boundary. Even listening to music, you hear it in the background. It isn't, a, it isn't a sound that destroys, but it gives perspective. It's like space, consciousness, space, infin infinity. 
no boundary. And when you know how to use that, how to develop that is, notice also when you're in that space or in that, with the sound of silence, you stop thinking. The mind's very empty. Just like space, contemplating space, your mind is spacious. The sound of silence, it's silent. You have this sense of, even though it, it seems like a sound, it's a, it's a kind of oxymoron, the sound of silence. Stillness. It's a still, uh, like a still point. And you don't create it. It's not a creation, not an imagination. It's self-sustaining. So it's not up to me to try to to make it happen, but to just recognize it. You know, just, just by listening, by being fully open and kind of relaxed attention. So from this point of silence and stillness, you, you have perspective on, you begin to, you can really clarify what self is. You know, like uh, in the ten fetters, there's first three fetters that block stream entry or sotapanna, uh, sakya ditti self-personality view, or the ego, the created self, the first fetter. From the still point, from the stillness, you begin to see how you create yourself. So the still point, there's no self. There's no person. If you just rest in the stillness, in that stream, there's no, there's no person. There's consciousness. But are you anybody yet? To be your personality, you have to start thinking. I'm Arjun Tomato, and then I... <laughs> but I don't need to think I'm Arjun Tomato. Maybe that's appropriate, you know, in, a, in somebody, when we're introducing ourselves. I say I'm Ajahn Sumedho, but most of the time I don't really go around thinking that. But I assume I'm Ajahn Sumedho, you know, all the time. And you assume I'm Ajahn Sumedho all the time, don't you? You think, <laughs> you, think you know, where is Ajahn Sumedho? Oh, well, he's in his room. When I'm asleep, you know, I'm still Ajahn Sumedho. But when you're really aware, you know, these, it, it changes from assuming you're the same person all the time. Because you're not, in reality, you're not at all. The personality changes and adjusts its condition. You know, it's quite obvious, you know, how your personality will adapt to, to the conditions you're in, the people you're with. The, the duties you're performing, you, you adjust, your personality will adjust itself to that. So Sakya Bhitti then is, can be seen very obviously as a, and, and we can no longer believe in, in our personalities as ourselves. There's pure awareness, pure subjectivity through this sound of silence. It's conscious, empty, 
anatta, non-self, there's no self. It's like this. So this is encouraging you to inform yourself in this way, to really notice. You know, this is so that you, you you consciously noting and recognizing anatta as reality, not just some kind of Buddhist idea that you're not quite sure what it is about, or c- attached to a definition of anatta or the idea of anatta. This is anatta. This simple still point of awareness. Now sustaining, because it's self-sustaining, our attention to it varies. If we aren't used to it, then we, we tend to ignore it, or we tend to identify it with maybe very perfect conditions. Like everybody's quiet, noble silence, and you're kind of calmed down a bit, settling in. And so therefore you identify the, this with the experience that you're having now, which is, which is an extreme experience. Noble silence is not usually our way of living, is it? Or the meditation retreat at Spirit Rock through special conditions. But use this retreat for familiarizing yourself, learning to recognize this. And then when we don't leave the retreat, you begin to really notice it everywhere. <coughs> in the city, in the noise of traffic, in the committee meetings, in when you're alone, when you're with others. Because it's, it's, it's here and now, it's, ne- it's always present, it's just our attention to it. We forget it and we get caught into the responsibilities, duties, problems of the world, which are endless. The world's problems are endless. <laughs> you may have observed this yourself by now. <laughs> well, Lingpa Chai used to say, this is where the world ends. The end of the world is this. It's not like what President Bush is looking forward to. Not Armageddon. It's simple. I mean, this is the end of the world. So you notice that the end of the world is peaceful. <coughs> Not being anybody, no self, is peaceful. It's a relief, isn't it? To, to support yourself always as a person is, is, is uh, exhausting. You know, it's it, it really, uh, you know, you have to defend yourself and prove yourself and, and, and be self-conscious and frightened and worried and, and endlessly self-concerned is, is real torture. Being a person is not, is not a, is, a, is, a, is really a lot of suffering and it goes on and on. But not non-person, anatta, is very simple, very pure, very natural. It's just not recognized, not noticed.
Well, if, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you don't notice this round of friends, don't worry about it. Don't make it into a problem. I just encourage you to, to uh, you know, to, to, this is where how to, to notice it is to relax the tension, opening. When you start conceiving it, the danger is always talking about it is that you start looking for something. I know people on retreat that talk about sound of silence, they spend the whole retreat trying to find it. <laughs> because they, you conceive it as some something, you know, and you're looking for something special. And and then then they come up and say, Is it uh, Am I right? Is it that kind of buzzing thing? <laughs> I think they're looking for some kind of sublime, angelic kind of angelic chorus, maybe. Hallelujah chorus. <laughs> oh, it, it is. It's, it's monotone, isn't it? It's, it's, it's it's a stream. It's like the stream, conscious stream, sustaining itself. It's not created. And then emotionally, we can react to this boring. You know, <coughs> it's not interesting because where. You listen to music, and and it uh, it can excite, can't you? It can stimulate, excite, can make you feel excited and exhilarated or sad, give you all kinds of emotional uh, ups and downs. But this is <coughs> so emotionally we can we're not prepared for this. Emotionally, we are some of the you know one of the my oldest. Uh, Disciples in England. She doesn't like it at all. <coughs> I just can't bear it. <laughs> she won't get. She plays a lot of meta, but. Uh, I mean that's because it, it it doesn't seem like anything worthwhile or in terms of extremity. So like yesterday's ref reflection on ordinariness. It's not a it's not a it's subtle in its way because you know because we tend to overlook it. It's like space consciousness. We're not we're not aware. And recognize consciousness unless we put something into it, like a form, and then we're conscious through attachment to things. <coughs> but conscious without attachment, consciousness without attachment, this stream, this sound of silence. And then, then the rest of it falls into place, like emptiness, sunyata, anatta, nibbana, non-attachment, desirelessness. Uraga. So from this perspective, then we can uh, let go of the world that we we bind ourselves to, and, and all the problems that we create with that.
I encourage you to, like, like Satya Ditti, this word, this first letter, Siddha Bhattabhaya Masa, the second one, is really cultural conditioning, attachment to convention. It's your whole cultural programming, your assumptions, attitudes that we've acquired through social conditioning, through cultural conditioning. Assumptions we make about purity and heaven, hell, and even Buddhism, and the, uh, the way we're attached, we can be attached to ideas and opinions around Buddhism, practice, Theravada, Mahayana, all of this, these way we, these conventions we, we hold to and cling to. Or assumptions we have as as Americans, as you notice, living in Thailand, for example, you're adjusting yourself to a, to a completely different culture. Just the American conditioning becomes very apparent. You know, a lot of it <coughs> isn't all that conscious. <coughs> uh, because it, you acquire it when you're an innocent child, most of it, you're pretty well, you know, culturally conditioned in your early years. So we have assumptions and, you know, Americans basically, you know, I found a kind of arrogant attitude that I never thought of myself as arrogant was a kind of one of my arrogant assumptions. <laughs> but living in a in a, in, a, in a different culture, you know, sometimes brings up and it kind of makes you see what being American is <coughs> as, a, as a cultural conditioning process. So it's not American. It's a, emptiness is not American, not even Buddhist. So in terms of the first two letters, Sakyatiti Siddha Bhattabhara Masa, Vichikicha is the third one, is, is the doubt, skeptical doubt, and this is called through thinking. Through language is another condition, you know, thinking is conditioned. Languages are not created out of wisdom, out of enlightened masters. So, thinking process, when you think, try to figure it out, you end up skeptical and doubtful. So, and notice that these first three studies are human-made conditions. They're not natural conditions, they're artificial, like the self, the cultural conditioning, the language. These are human creations. Consciousness, we don't create that. But so we create these conditions and then experience consciousness through these, through our own creation. Now this is, these are the three stutters that, that uh, we need to see through to realize the path. They're called the stotapanna or stream entry have insight into the path. And so, with this way, this way of reflecting, you begin to get clear perspective on the path and, and, and what is not the path. As you, as you peel away the illusions you, you've created around yourself as a person, your cultural assumptions, conventional attitudes, and the thinking process itself. So you're getting outside thinking, cultural conditioning, and the ego, the personality. And so to do that, then this is, this is uh, learning to reflect on this, put, it, put the, these conditions as objects, 
be the awareness, be in the, the stillness itself, where the conditions arise and cease. Your personality will come and go, and your assumptions, cultural attachments, the thinking process itself. When all these things aren't operative, there's stillness, which is bliss. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, going forward and gentle feet, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties, and preserving their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature, let them not the slightest thing that the wise would later be within in gladness and in safety, may all be in ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another, or despise any being in any state, then none to or ill will wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so the boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, Seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views. The pure hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Arahantamma Sandhya <laughs> 
ุปเจตโนภะคะวะโตสาวะโตสังโฆเวรุปวันสิกายตุเรวะสัตติตระสัมบัญญัมังภะบาสุยัสนะอ opportunity for intensive practice is rare. I find that samatha is what speaks to my need of focusing. Dig in. I touch levels under my daily story, and this feels like right view. Please speak of about samatha. You know that. สมถะวิปัสสนาอีสสมถะอีสก็คือการมันต์เล็กซ์เซอร์ไซส์คอนเซนเทรตในมายด์และและในอบเจกต์ที่ทำให้เราเพิ่มความรู้สึกสงบสันติสุขและ And then uh, the p a s a n a is investigation, is in the four foundation of mindfulness, four noble truths. So, s a m a t a is a is like yoga or tai chi. <laughs> It's a good practice, healthy to do. <coughs> That uh, it also people tend to to come from you know wanting p 
peace and tranquility as their main object. And, and so uh, this is something to really look out for, that we have, how we, we become very controlling and very angry if things interrupt our tranquility. <coughs> So it's, uh, you know, like the, <coughs> it's wanting happiness and peace and becoming, uh, holding on to that as long as we can and then resenting when it, uh, when it doesn't happen or when somebody or something uh, disrupts it. So we need wisdom to develop wisdom also. So I don't, there's various views on people with monks and so forth, with views about samatha vipassana, but I see them more or less like they work together. You know, you're you're not. You know, that one helps the other. So oftentimes, come the samatha is like the candle in the flame. Is vipassana wisdom? The candle is, you know, if you have spend your time just making a candle without lighting it, doesn't, it will never see properly. <laughs> <laughs> and if the candle's too big, it doesn't light very well. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's uh, finding the, how to make a candle you know, well enough to, to use uh, for seeing, for wisdom. So like in, uh, what I'm emphasizing on this retreat is not samatha vipassana, but so much as the right view, uh, an attitude <coughs> which um, helps both because Samatha is just coming from, you know, personal preference for peace and tranquility tends to increase a, a, a selfish interest in, in, you know, controlling everything and, and uh, getting nice states of mind. Where if Samatha is used with the right attitude, then it, it's also about relinquishing because you uh, you know, to develop samatha, you're, you're actually relinquishing not, you know, not to attain, to, to achieve something, but just seeing the, the, um, the, the factors of, of coarseness that get in the way and re relieving, relinquishing, abandoning those factors till there's equanimity. So the, the attitude is one of relinquishing rather than a personal attainment. So when the person that wrote this note says, note your own reasons, or your own personal desire to attain or achieve something, or, or what, you know, what is your, what is this, this interest in samatha, how, do, how are you holding it? Is it increasing the, of your opinions, your views, your sense of the self? And isolating you, or is it uh, held in a way that it, it is a uh, you're feeling a sense of relinquishing, and the, the the sense of self is is not being uh, reinforced. 